So hello, I'm Giovanni Camurati. Today I will present you screaming channels, that is side channel attacks when transceivers, radio transceivers are present in the target device that we try to attack. This is a joint work with my colleagues, Marius Munch, Sebastian Peplau, Tom Ace, and our supervisor, Aurelien Francillon. So when we look at embedded devices, there are some that are designed for security applications, such as passports, smart cards, and they use cryptography uh, to protect against a range of attacks. Uh, for example, uh, these attacks usually uh, involve stealing the device, trying to clone it, trying to tamper with it. So they are also protected against physical attacks, which require this kind of physical access. So one class of uh, physical attacks are side channels, and the root cause behind side channels is that uh, when we perform some um, operation on a device, the physical implementation has an activity, and this physical activity depends on the logic data being processed, so that we could measure it in several ways. We could measure the current, so the power consumption over the power supply. We could measure the direct electromagnetic emissions from uh, some of the components on the device. Or we could also see that there are some signals in the system, such as the clock, which may act as carriers that are modulated by this uh, logic activity. And so we could take a radio, tune it into the frequency of this carrier, and retrieve the information. Once we retrieve the information, we have traces that contain information about some, for example, cryptographic algorithm. Here you can see a yes. You can distinguish the key schedule and the 10 rounds. And uh, once we have these traces, we can run a number of attacks like simple power analysis, differential, correlation, template, and so on and so forth, uh, which basically consists in uh, well, one of the most common types consists in finding a variable that we can somehow measure through a leak and somehow guess based on the value of uh, the key, uh, well, the guessed value of the key, so that we, if we see a correlation between guesses and real measurements, that means the guess is correct, otherwise the guess uh, is wrong. Uh, there are a lot of side channel attacks which uh, are based on electromagnetic emissions. We have, of course, the seminal papers on electromagnetic attacks, which work uh, in the range of millimeters or centimeters. We have uh, some work on laptops uh, where uh, the authors can break cryptographic algorithm through a wall through, uh, from around 15 centimeters. Uh, there is a um, maximum distance of 30 centimeter or even one meter in a laboratory, like an echoic chamber environment uh, called Tempest AES against AES 2056. And then there is an interesting uh, series of attacks called Tempest. Uh, one example is uh, on video. So when a, a computer sends a video stream to a monitor through a VGA cable or HDMI cable, well, the signals that flow into this cable uh, leak through the cable itself or through the connectors so that it's possible to retrieve what is being sent to the screen from a very large distance, even more than 10 meters. But besides these uh, devices that are security oriented, let's say, there are also other classes of embedded systems. And for example, one of the most popular are connected devices, like a smartwatch or an IP camera. And these devices still use cryptography, but this time to protect the uh, communication link, for example, from a smartwatch to a smart uh, phone. In this case, uh, only remote attacks are considered, usually not physical attacks. We could say that if the device uh, falls in the hands of the attacker and he has physical access, well, the device is already lost for any for different reasons, but we care that there is no eavesdropper that can sit uh, beside us and listen to the health-sensitive uh, information flowing from the smartwatch to our smartphone. Unfortunately, if we want to have wireless connectivity, we also have to add wireless hardware, that is a radio. So one popular architecture is the so-called mixed signal chips. Uh, they contain the digital logic, that is the, the processor and peripherals and other hardware blocks, uh, which is the one that generates that data-dependent noise on which uh, side channel attacks are based. But it also contains, on the same silicon die, the radio logic. And even though we are talking about digital radio protocols, the underlying hardware components are analog, and analog components are noise sensitive. And uh, they are on the same silicon die, so there are a lot of paths through which noise can propagate from one side to the other. 
So the intuition behind screaming channels is that this noise propagates, it's upconverted, and so we ask ourselves the question, can we actually measure it from a large distance and can we exploit it somehow? Can we really mount, say, channel attacks based on this? So the answer is yes. Let me show you an example. Here you can see we took a mixed signal chip, which has a Cortex M4 processor and uh, a Bluetooth transmitter on the same die. And we placed it at around two meters from uh, our receiver made with an off the shelf antenna and a software defined radio. So then we looked at the spectrogram. The spectrogram is a plot. On the y-axis, you have frequency. On the x-axis, you have time. So you can see how frequency evolves over time. Here you can see that when the radio is off, uh, well, there is a uniform distribution of noise at low power, so there's no information. But if we start sending, uh, turning on the, the radio and sending packets, we can see we distinguish the packets because they, they are interleaved by noise, by no transmission at all. In this moment, our firmware is doing nothing else than spinning in a polling loop at a fixed loop that waits for our comment to encrypt. So it's spinning at a fixed frequency. So the noise it generates, it's at a fixed frequency and we can see it in the spectrogram. And if we ever change the size of the loop by changing the number of instructions, we can see changes that are uh, that corresponds to uh, what we do, the changes that we do. And more interestingly, if we start running AS, then we can really see when AS starts. And maybe it's clearer to see it in the time domain where you can distinguish the key schedule and the 10 rounds. So uh, we have our connected devices, device, uh, which is uh, sending some intended transmission, for example, at one meter to, for example, a smartphone. We could do some classic electromagnetic side channels uh, in close proximity, but we now have also a new point that are leaks that are transmitted over a potentially very large distance, for example, 10 meters, and that could be retrieved with very cheap uh, off-the-shelf uh, equipment. Uh, an example of application would be that the communication is encrypted, but we listen to it uh, with the new kind of leak. We retrieve the key with a side channel attack, and then we break the encryption and we use it to retrieve the plain text data. But how do we uh, move from having this digital noise in the digital domain to having noise in the digital, in the radio transmission, sorry, and to exploit it? So let's first have a look at the mixed signal chips. So the idea, as I said before, is to put on the same silicon die, a CPU, some hard cryptographic hardware, some peripherals, and a radio. Uh, we do that because it's extremely convenient in terms of cost, power, area, and most of all, because they are very easy to integrate in other systems. So the designer of a larger system can just take one single chip, program an application on its processor and with some easy APIs access popular wireless protocols such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a view of a mixed signal chip from a functional point of view. On the left side, you have the digital components and on the right side, you have uh, the transmitter. And on the bottom, you have a section of how the chip is actually built. So you can see that the digital and analog uh, parts are built on the same substrate. So the digital part is producing noise, but this noise can propagate to one side from one side to the other through some different kind of couplings, substrate coupling, coupling through the power supply, through the ground at different levels in the design. And it then affects the analog uh, transmitter. So the designers usually take this in, uh, take care about this uh, from a functionality point of view. So they uh, make sure that this architecture works and uh, that it doesn't impact the transmission of other devices. But uh, Unfortunately, this, have, uh, this has a security impact. So if before we had our leak uh, at a low frequency, say 64 megahertz of clock frequency of our Bluetooth chip, and now we have a carrier at 2.4 gigahertz, and this carrier is modulated by the noise coming from the digital domain, then now our leak is at uh, around 2.4 gigahertz, and it's amplified and transmitted through the let's say, intended uh, system for radio transmission. So we can tune our radio into it and retrieve the uh, information, the sensitive information about cryptography running on the processor. Uh, 
And uh, well, if you re retrieve the traces, then we can do the same attacks as before. So correlation or template, and we call them correlate correlation radio analysis. And now they work at up to uh, one, two meters in, um, Really in a realistic environment like this room or an office or a house, and uh, we pushed it to uh, 10 meters into an anechoic chamber. But uh, how do we uh, extract the information from the radio signal? So first of all, let's have a look at a uh, radio transmitter, a modern radio transmitter. We have the in-phase and quadrature signals that are the signals that contain the actual information. And by changing the amplitude of these two signals, we can change the amplitude or the frequency of the carrier, so implement any modern uh, protocol. So the carrier itself is generated by a voltage-controlled oscillator and it's then mixed with the information signals and they are uh, amplified and transmitted if we have noise sorry if we have noise coming from the digital domain this noise may couple with uh, any of these components and end up in changing the amplitude or the frequency of the output carrier let's make an example uh, the one that we used uh, during our attack that explains our attack so uh, let's take a Bluetooth chip, which is using Gaussian frequency shift keying. So basically we change the amplitude of I and Q in such a way that we change the phase in blue VK of the output carrier. If now we have some noise from the digital domain, which is, as we saw before, at the clock frequency, but also contains information about AES. So it's basically the, a, a signal at the clock, which has the clock frequency as carrier and the AES as information. And uh, let's imagine that this signal flows through the power supply to the power amplifier. And so it's mixed with uh, the uh, intended signal. And this ends up in amplitude modulating the uh, output carrier, as you can see in red. So if we have this, we have the, that the result is a component at the frequency of the carrier plus the frequency of the clock, which contains information about AES execution if it's running on the processor. So we can just take a radio receiver, tune into that frequency, perform quadrature amplitude demodulation, and get back the baseband signal with, with information about execution. But now, we have that the processor is not always encrypting. So we have a signal that sometimes contains uh, encryption. So we need a way to extract this information. If we have a look at the zoom of the uh, previous uh, uh, spectrogram, we can uh, observe uh, two AES uh, encryptions. And uh, we can see that at the beginning, there is the key schedule. And the key schedule has some characteristic frequency component that appears each time an encryption starts. So we could tune into that and uh, transform it in a trigger signal. With this trigger signal, we can identify a time window around the encryption. So here you can see the window is around the key schedule and the first rounds. And if you use that to extract, uh, we will find, uh, you can see the zoom in the last plot. We, we will find, uh, let's say, end traces uh, with this shape. We can use uh, cross-correlation for having a fine-grained alignment between them. And then we can use averaging to remove the random noise which is on top of the measurement, for example, thermal noise. And we obtain a very clean trace. Once we have this very clean trace, we can move to an attack. So uh, our target uh, device is a chip with a Cortex-M4 and a Bluetooth transmitter, and it's running different implementations of AES. We took them from the SDK of the uh, device, and we have Tiny AES, which is simpler, and the AES inside uh, embed TLS. Uh, we automated the extractions of uh, these uh, encryptions. So we send the plain text to the device and we get the extracted tra corresponding extracted traces. And uh, then we run, run uh, correlation or template attacks. Uh, and our code is currently based on the chip whisper implementation. So there are many more attacks which are more advanced. So we show the potential of the channel and not the potential of the analysis techniques over the traces. So I would like to show you how the attack evolved over time. At the beginning, we wanted to uh, 
consider only the simplest case possible uh, to make the measurement easy. So we used a cable. We connected the device through a cable that we hacked into the on, on the antenna. The attack worked. So we moved to a few centimeters and then two meters. Uh, in as you can see, that is uh, one of our apartments. So in realistic environments. Uh, then we wanted to estimate the template of the device in a better way and to push the attack forward. So we decided to move to a test uh, environment and an echoic chamber. Here we reached uh, first three meters. Then as we improved over time the attack uh, and our measurement setup, we reached five meters and finally 10 meters. And then we uh, reached the end of the anechoic chamber. So we couldn't test uh, further for now. Uh, we want to protect against this new uh, side channel attack. So uh, the thing that we have to take into account is that we are talking about connected devices that are cheap and that uh, are small, they have to consume uh, little power, and we don't have the resources to implement complex um, countermeasures. So yes, we could use a classic countermeasures, hardware or software ones, which uh, basically consist in uh, trying to add some algorithmic or physical noise to decorrelate the measurements from uh, the data being processed, uh, or uh, trying to refresh the key very often at the protocol level, but they may be too expensive for this kind of device. And the important thing is that they try to protect a single implementation of a cryptographic algorithm, but they don't protect from the new kind of channels. So if they, for example, leave some uh, higher order leak, then that higher order leak can be exploited again via radio with a more advanced attack and an arms race can start. More interestingly, there are some countermeasures that are specific to our new channel. So on the software side, this is probably the most effective and the simplest countermeasure. We can just turn off uh, sensitive computations during transmission or vice versa. And uh, this, uh, well, it's very effective because it turns off the channel, but there may be problems in case of real time environments and complex applications into really implementing it uh, uh, on the, in the software. Then there is, uh, on the hardware side, well, we could try to target the root cause of uh, the channel. So trying to investigate how the impact, uh, the security impact of the noise propagation between uh, the digital domain and the radio domain, and not only the functional impact. But again, this may be hard and expensive and impact the time to market of the device and so on. We found a reference to something similar, a similar effect. So Tempest Fundamentals is a document which dates back to the 80s, but was declassified in 2000. Uh, so the time when electromagnetic side channels were more or less discovered uh, in public research. And it describes several ways through which uh, sensitive uh, signals can propagate. So we have uh, radiation, we have conduction, we have acoustic propagation, and then there is a little reference to something that may be similar to screaming channels and may have been exploited, uh, that is modulation of an unintended, unintended signal, sorry. But this part is totally redacted and there is no information about it. We responsibly disclosed our results to the major vendors, to multiple thirds in different countries, and we always received uh, an knowledge of acknowledgement of the relevance of the problem, but most of all of its uh, generality. And uh, vendors are trying to replicate it and to find countermeasures. Uh, to conclude, I would stress this point that uh, the attack is uh, general. So we showed an attack on software AES uh, on a Bluetooth chip, but we also have preliminary results on hardware AES, on Wi-Fi, on other chips, and uh, maybe this uh, problem potentially affects uh, any device where there is a radio transmitter besides something uh, sensitive. So we have introduced a new point in the threat model space, the possibility of mounting a side channel attack on electromagnetic emissions from a large distance. And that means that now we have to consider it. And we may consider it during design because maybe today a device is not vulnerable for a specific vendor, but maybe tomorrow we would make a choice for reducing power or for reducing cost that will affect the security of the device because it will maybe make a screaming channel possible. And uh, also for some applications, there may be it may, it may be necessary to implement countermeasures 
and these countermeasures must be smart and be specific to the new kind of channel and to the kind of devices we are targeting. Uh, we have many directions for future research. So first of all, trying to optimize the attack and to push it forward to larger distances. We believe that there is a potential for going much farther than what we uh, achieved now. Uh, we would like to try it on different cryptographic algorithms and different wireless technologies and also try to mount realistic attacks on security protocols that are used uh, every day. So thank you very much for your attentions. Don't hesitate to ask questions. And uh, all the information, the details to uh, reproduce our work are online on our GitHub. And you can also find some traces if you don't want to collect them uh, again. You cannot. Thank you again. Hi. Jeju uh, University Rochester. So if I understand correctly, your work uh, is mainly concerned with the information leak, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, mean, it, uh, I have a question that might not be uh, directly related with your research, but I'm very curious. Is it possible for an attacker to uh, use some noise to mess up the integrity of the program running on the device? For example, uh, you know, most cars, they have radio receivers. Is it possible to uh, send some signals uh, or noises to change how the program is running on the car's device. So if I understand correctly, you're talking about doing a sort of reverse uh, attack, doing uh, a, uh, transmitting something and... Yeah, so uh, you, you, on your slides you mentioned it, uh, it, your device can receive some noise, right? And that changes uh, something, I, I, I'm not uh, sure clear of all the details but oh, okay so I think the idea is that here we have a device which generates mm -hmm. noise because of the mixed mm -hmm. signal path so we can retrieve it from another side mm -hmm. but yeah there is an open question that is can we actually send signals to the mixed signal chip yes. and exploit the path to do some fault injection or something so yes. it's an open question we haven't looked into it but it must may be interesting yeah okay thank you Hi, right, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I would have two questions. Uh, first of all, um, what kind of model do you consider when you target the, the sensitive value? Uh, are you applying directly template attacks or CPA with farming weight uh, also works? Uh, so for the uh, 10 meters attack, we have a template and we use the output of the S-Box. But uh, we also tried at other distances a uh, plain correlation attack and it works. And uh, um, actually, other attacks are possible uh, than those. So it's totally, it's a channel that is totally equivalent to measuring the power, let's say. So we use the output of the S box, but we could use something else. But with uh, humming weight, you mean? Yes. Oh, okay. The humming weight of the output of the S box. And second one, uh, did you study the efficiency of the attack? Uh, as a function of the distance, the the required uh, number of trace to succeed uh, as a function of the distance of the to the device. Uh, not in a really systematic way, but I can tell you that in the with with our results now with our technology now, the attacks uh, in the anechoic chamber required more or less uh, to double the size of the template at ten meters with respect to five meters uh, to work. It, it could be linear, you mean? Uh, no, no, it's not necessarily linear, no. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Hugo Vincent from ARM. Um, so if I understood correctly, the, the AES is running in software on a CPU on the chip, right? Yes. Um, did you consider if there's a hardware accelerator? Like a lot of these chips have hardware uh, AES blocks, Yes, right? we, we also have uh, tried uh, the hardware accelerator present on the chip. So of course it's harder to attack because uh, well, it consumes less, but the, our attack is starting to work. So we see the leak and uh, we retrieve some of the bytes. We would need to improve the attack analysis a little bit to break it completely. And if that block was DPA resistant against traditional, you know, direct voltage probing, would that be sufficient to protect against the EM coupling leakage? Well, it would be, it's like it not related to the channel we have. So if we have an attack that is possible on uh, close proximity, for example, an higher order attack against that protection, then in theory, it would be possible also with our, uh, at a distance. Then of course, the harder it becomes, uh, the harder it becomes also for our channel. 
And finally, in your software um, ciphers, did you consider um, masking and blinding and sort of software techniques for, for making traditional power uh, side channels um, for mitigating them? Yes, yes. It's basically the, the first countermeasures would be to apply classic masking. Yep. It's just that uh, for the actually for the vendors who produce the chips and that have to sell or release their SDKs, <laughs> Uh, well, it may be expensive to develop them or to buy licenses and so on. But of course, it will work uh, perfectly. Thank you. Uh, I'm Naila Bugazale from University of California in Riverside. Thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, there is work in uh, like the system on a chip community about EMI shifting to keep, you know, the chip from interfering with the uh, with the transmitter and so on. Uh, can you do you have a sense for what is causing the coupling on the on the chip that you have? I mean, would techniques like that uh, potentially help uh, prevent this problem as well? Uh, so the, at the physical level. Yeah. So uh, we thought about substrate coupling because mm -hmm. we were talking about mixed signal chips, but also about uh, coupling through the power supply. So we think on that specific chip that I've shown, uh, the coupling goes through the power supply. Okay. It may be also on the ground lines at the PCB level. So probably for each device, it would be necessary to investigate exactly it. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.